Paleoclimate is the study of past climates. Paleo comes from the ancient Greek word paleos, which means old, and climate is the term we use for the long-term weather pattern in a particular area over a period of at least 30 years. Put these words together and you get the study of paleoclimate, which is interested in the changes in climate and environment over broad geologic timescales. We can look back hundreds, thousands, even millions of years into the geologic record to reconstruct the conditions of the past. Some of these conditions that we can measure include past sea levels, ocean and air temperature, atmospheric composition, seawater chemistry, and precipitation levels, to name a few. And knowledge about past climates can help us to understand, to contextualize, and to predict the Earth's dynamic response to current and future climate change. Paleoclimatology is also a critical tool for understanding the planet's natural climate variability, which helps us to figure out the role of human activity on our warming world. But we can't go back in time, so how can we see into the past? Scientists use natural archives of climate information called proxy records. Evidence for past temperature and climate conditions is preserved in a diverse array of settings on land and in the ocean, like tree rings, marine sediments, glacial ice, cave deposits called speleothems, and pollen in lake sediments. One of my favorite ways to measure the changes in past climate and environment is by using Delta C13. Delta C13 is an isotopic signature that measures the ratio between the two stable isotopes of carbon, carbon-13, which is heavier in mass, and carbon-12, which is lighter in mass. This ratio varies depending on climatic and environmental factors, and so it's a useful tool for studying paleoclimate. It's expressed as per mil, and it's calculated by comparing the ratio in your sample relative to a reference standard which is basically a sample of known isotopic values. Delta 13C values can either be positive or negative. A more negative value indicates more carbon-12, while a more positive value indicates more carbon-13. In the atmosphere, we find carbon in the form of carbon dioxide, and the composition of atmospheric carbon dioxide is dominated by carbon-12. It's made up of 98.9% .9 of the lighter isotope carbon-12 and just 1.1% of the heavier carbon-13. During photosynthesis, organisms like algae and plants preferentially assimilate the lighter isotope. This is called isotope fractionation. By extracting more of the lighter isotope, these creatures change the ratio between carbon-13 and carbon-12 in their surroundings. Similarly, in the ocean, photosynthesizing organisms draw carbon from the carbon dioxide dissolved in the water column and leave behind a higher relative abundance of carbon-13, which other marine organisms then use to build their shells. So, for example, if there's more photosynthesis, which we also refer to as higher primary productivity, that means more isotope fractionation and a higher relative abundance of carbon-13 which results in more calcium carbonate shells being made by calcifying critters like mollusks and foraminifera. Their shells are then preserved in the marine sedimentary record because as you may know from my first video, when those calcifying organisms die, they slowly filter down to the bottom of the ocean where they eventually become buried under layers of sediment and then turned into limestones. These carbonate rocks preserve the delta C13 values, and so they are amazing archives of primary productivity and shifts in the carbon cycle. But productivity isn't the only factor that influences delta C13 values in marine carbonate rocks. During times of high volcanism, for example, we tend to see more negative delta C13 values because carbon dioxide released from volcanoes typically has a high carbon-12 content. So it's important to interpret delta C13 values in their geologic and temporal context. We can measure the delta C13 values of carbonate rocks using an isotope ratio mass spectrometer. So essentially you put your carbonate rock into the mass spec in powder form. Um, and then the inorganic carbon gets dissolved and carbon dioxide is released, and then the mass spec analyzes the isotopic content of the carbon dioxide that's released during the acidification process. 
Here are some of my limestone samples from the late Silurian period, so around 420 million years ago. I sampled these rocks from the Inyo Mountains in California, and I've cut them into these rectangular shapes called billets using a rock saw. Then I drilled them with this drill in order to get them in powder form to be analyzed in the mass spectrometer. I'm measuring the delta C13 values of these rocks to test the expression or the magnitude of one of the largest carbon isotope anomalies of the Phanerozoic Eon, which is the most recent eon that spans the time period from about 540 million years ago up to the present day. This anomaly, which occurred during the late Silurian period, is called the Mid-Ludfordian Carbon Isotope Excursion, or the MLCIE. Ultimately, delta C13 is a powerful geochemical tool. We can use it to track paleoclimate mysteries like the MLCIE and to improve our climate models for the future. Proxies like these are windows into the past that can teach us so much about our planet's response to climate change with real implications for the future.